Welcome back to the channel. Tonight's video will cover some Australian hometown horrors. Some of you may know these stories from other sources, so let me know if I got them right or not at the end of the video. And while I will be back with some ghost stories on the next upload, I hope you enjoy this video. Sydney, New South Wales. On August 11th, 1994, a crew of early morning fishermen aboard the Lady Morrison were in the Hawkesbury River when one of the boat's nets became caught on what appeared to be a rusty metal bar in the river. This wasn't unusual as wreckages and debris always tends to find itself in rivers and lakes from time to time. So the men dug a little deeper and craned up the structure onto the boat to free their net. As the discovery lifted out of the water and onto the boat, the men saw the metal structure resembling the shape of a crucifix attached with plastic bags. One of the men noticed a bone sticking out of one of those plastic bags and the crew contacted the local authorities. The fishermen had hauled a decomposing body wrapped in plastic bags and tied to rusted metal bars welded into the shape of a crucifix. Wire and orange rope were used to tie the body to the frame. Authorities were able to find DNA evidence in the form of hair and soft tissue attached to the remains, but due to being underwater for about a year, according to the barnacle growth on the frame, and the clothes he wore being common type clothing, nothing could be used to identify the man. Without a name, those close to the case started dubbing him the Rackman. The New South Wales Institute of Forensic Science was able to determine that the remains belonged to a Caucasian male from Central or Southern Europe. He likely had dark hair between 21 and 46 years old and between 5 feet 2 and 5 feet 4 inches tall. The cause of death was noted as a blunt trauma to the head, but experts couldn't determine if the man was killed beforehand or while affixed to the frame. The rack man's face was reconstructed by using computer-enhanced imagery and published on Australia's Most Wanted, which resulted in an overwhelming response from viewers claiming that the man could be either missing man Joe Biviano or Peter Mitris, both from Sydney. Joe Biviano was a convicted drug dealer in Sydney who had a similar build to the rack man and being of Italian heritage mean that he fit into the Southern European profile. He went missing in 1993 at the age of 30 years old and was never found. Viviano shared facial features that resembled those in the image released by Australia's Most Wanted, although no DNA could be compared due to having no dental records on file and his relatives not matching the sample taken from the rack man's remains. Peter Mitris was a Greek businessman who went missing from King's Cross in Sydney in 1991. He died in an eerily similar fashion to the rack man, being bashed to death and dumped into the ocean off Sydney. However, he was much taller at about 5 feet 10, and when his teeth were compared to the Rackman's, they were significantly different. Both Biviano and Mitris remain missing to this day, and the case of the Rackman remains unsolved. Melbourne, Victoria. On March 1st, 1999, 15 year old Rachel Barber was reported missing by her parents after missing her pickup time following a dance class at the dance factory in the suburb of Richmond. She was last seen getting off a tram in the company of an unknown woman. Rachel's boyfriend, 16-year-old Emmanuel Manny Corella, came forward and shared information to Rachel's parents. Rachel told him that she was going to a job after dance class that night with someone she knew and was going to earn $500 for it, but didn't disclose anything about the job or its whereabouts. When Manny pressed, Rachel told him not to worry and that she was in good hands. Despite the first 72 hours of a missing person's investigation being the most critical, Victoria Police hesitated taking the statement initially, but eventually took a statement and began their search. Two weeks later, on March 14th, authorities arrested family friend and babysitter, 19-year-old, Caroline Reed Robertson in relation to Rachel's disappearance. Investigators had uncovered 
that Caroline was the woman who was seen in the company of Rachel shortly before she vanished. When questioned, Caroline confessed to killing Rachel. Caroline lured Rachel to her apartment under the guise of her earning $500 for a confidential psychological survey. Once inside Caroline's apartment, Caroline drugged Rachel with laced pizza and then strangled her to death with a phone cord. She kept Rachel's body in her apartment for days while her family frantically searched for her. Caroline then took Rachel's body to her father's farm in Kilmore, 45 miles or 72 k's north of Melbourne, and buried her in a shallow grave beside her cat, which she buried years earlier. When authorities found Rachel's body, the phone cord was still wrapped around Rachel's neck. When the barbers learnt of the news, they were devastated as Caroline was someone they trusted with their children's lives, having been hired to babysit Rachel and her younger siblings many times before. After burying Rachel, investigators had started suspecting Caroline after having identified phone records between Caroline's house and the barber household, which the barbers assumed were calls Rachel had taken. In addition to this, Caroline had also been exhibiting some odd behaviours, such as applying for a large loan and making inquiries with V-Line Trains, the regional public transport company for Victoria. Following her arrest, when her apartment was searched, an application for a birth certificate in the name of Rachel Elizabeth Barber was discovered, as well as a journal which revealed how she had plotted to drug and murder Rachel after compiling a psychological profile of a victim. Specifically, detailed plans to, quote, drug her, put her body in an army bag, and then disfigure and dump the body somewhere way out, end quote. Also in the journal were notes on how she had developed a disturbing obsession with Rachel and stalked her from a distance before befriending her and gaining her trust. Caroline was also successful in gaining the trust of Rachel's parents. Caroline Reed Robertson was sentenced to 20 years in prison with a minimum term of 14 and a half, but was paroled in 2015. Belanglo, New South Wales In November 2008, Carly Pierce Stevenson abruptly left her family home in Alice Springs, Northern Territory, with her daughter Candelise, after meeting her new boyfriend, Daniel Holden. Her family were caught by complete surprise when they left, as they left without any goodbyes or fanfare. Carly was rather close with her family, so this was considered quite out of character. Initially, Carly's family hadn't heard anything from her, and her mother raised a missing person report in September of 2009. The following month, Carly had contacted her mum and family by SMS, reassuring them she was safe and well, but she didn't want family contact at that time. As a result, her mum closed the missing person report. After that, Carly remained in touch with her family and friends by SMS, even so much as appealing for money from time to time. But after mid-2011, Carly had stopped messaging entirely. Unfortunately, Carly's mother passed away in 2012, allowing Carly's welfare checks to be unattended. But the case doesn't end here, as we now head over to Wainaka, South Australia. On July 15th, 2015, a driver found an abandoned suitcase along the Karunda Highway around Wainaka, South Australia. When the driver opened it, he found the remains of a small female child inside. Police made a public appeal for information that could help identify her based on items that were found inside the suitcase, such as clothing and a distinctive handmade quilt. One caller was able to identify that quilt as made by the child's grandmother who had died in 2012 believing her daughter and granddaughter were living interstate. The remains of the child belonged to Candelise Pierce. A positive identification was achieved by comparing DNA extracted from the child's skeletal remains with DNA retained from a neonatal heel prick test. 
a national DNA search linked the child's remains with the profile of a mother, identified remains found in the Belanglo State Forest. Carly was murdered in December 2018, and her badly decomposed remains were discovered by dirt bikers in the Belanglo State Forest in New South Wales. This was on August 29th, 2010. For five years, police and forensic pathologists worked to identify the remains, but were unsuccessful and assumed she may have been the victim of infamous serial killer Ivan Milat, who was known to hide the bodies of his victims in this forest. The last confirmed sightings of Carly and Candelise before their deaths was November 8th, 2008, when they were stopped by police on the Stewart Highway near Cooper Pedy in the far north of South Australia and in Charnwood ACT a month later. They were with Carly's boyfriend, Daniel, on both occasions. Daniel had sexually assaulted and murdered Carly. The cause of her death is suspected to be a broken neck. For two-year-old Candelise, she had died, quote, a violent death under terrible circumstances, end quote, in a nearby location four days later. The detailed injuries of both Carly and Candelise have not been shared by authorities. On October 2nd, 2015, Daniel Holden was arrested in Cessnock, New South Wales. He was charged with the murder of both Carly and Candelise. It was uncovered that Daniel was also in a relationship with a woman named Hazel Passmore, who allegedly stole Carly's identity after she was killed. Earlier in August 2008, Hazel had uploaded images of Candelise to her Facebook. She was photographed in the company of her own children at a motor show in Alice Springs, indicating that Daniel and Hazel had plotted to lure, kill, and assume the identity of Carly. Hazel was the one texting Carly's family, pretending she was still alive and well, while asking her family for money. It's believed that Daniel and Hazel stole up to $90,000 from Carly's account since 2008, as Carly had been receiving social security entitlements via Centrelink, and Hazel had used identity documents to impersonate her as Centrelink offices in South Australia to keep up the payments. Daniel was sentenced in the New South Wales Supreme Court to two consecutive life sentences without parole for the murders. That brings us to the end. Share your comments below, and for more true crime content and unsolved mysteries, consider subscribing to the channel. I'll see you on the next one.